Uh, adding on to the previous video on human and element, uh, I think it's important that we speak in more detail about the Babinski test uh, because it's frequently asked and it's a viva favorite and all the professors love going into this. So firstly, uh, this will be very brief and I'm just going to talk about the fallacies and the mistake, common mistakes that are made in the Babinski test because the basics is known by everyone. So firstly, when it comes to the procedure, everyone knows how to do it, but there are a few things that you should keep in mind while doing it. And these are the catches in doing the Babinski test. So the first thing is you should always have your knee extended when you do the Babinski test. So this is pretty obvious because most of the times we do the test when the patient is lying down. So in supine position then, and supine position is the best position to do it in. But suppose this patient is sitting down and the examiner says, hey, okay, uh, do it when he's sitting down or do it in the seated position. You should always make sure that the knee is completely extended when you do the Babinski test. So if the patient is sitting down, raise his leg, give support to his uh, leg, and then do the Babinski test with the knee extended because it has been documented and it is proven many a times that uh, you don't always get the accurate result when the knee is flexed. So one of the important points is firstly, knee extended. Secondly, we always uh, go to the far uh, lateral region of the foot to do the test. We don't do it medially. We actually go very laterally. This is because the Babinski itself has the afferent nerve being the sural nerve. And this sural nerve or the S1 dermatome is what we want to stimulate. And this is really in the lateral aspect of the foot. So you start somewhere down at the heel and you move at a steady and continuous pace. So steady and continuous is very important. Not very fast. You got to go at a steady pace. And most importantly, it has to be a continuous motion. Starting from the heel over the lateral aspect of foot. And then you move in medially and you stop just before you reach the base of the great toe. This is really important. Most people say you end at the base of the great toe, but ideally you should stop just before you reach the base of the great toe. And when you're around somewhere here, you should start seeing a Babinski positive if it is so, or if it is there. And another common mistake uh, that uh, happens is we tend to say Babinski positive and Babinski negative. Babinski positive, yes, it is indicated and it is accepted, but Babinski negative is actually not accepted. The best way to say is uh, say it is uh, there's a flexor response or a normal response. It's, it's considered normal in most cases. So you can say it's a normal response or there was a flexor response on doing the Babinski test. Two questions that are frequently uh, on minds of people is how much pressure should I give? So uh, there are many schools of thought and there is some belief that it's a noxious stimuli and you have to press very deep and um, or a no nociceptive if I'm not wrong. You should press really deep. So that is not really warranted as far as the sources uh, uh, or according to the sources that I've referred to. It is important that you're firm, not too light because then it just gets ticklish. So it shouldn't be as light as a tickle. Neither should it be painful or a deep stimulation. And the best way to really overcome this is to practice. Start light and then keep going firmer and firmer till you see the response and you make that your habit. And uh, so a few of the in, uh, common mistakes that are done is uh, not firm enough stimulation that can help you get a wrong response or if the stimulation is too medial or the stimulation is too fast i told you earlier steady and continuous is really important and if the foot is cold also you can actually miss out on a babinski positive and lastly what is the best thing to do the babinski test with or the best instrument if you have a key which is blunt ended so the concept is that it should be blunt in a blunt ended so if you have a key which is pointed but blunt uh, or uh, sharp but blunt rather sharp as in it is covering less area but blunt on the tip uh, it's it's really ideal so keys are ideal babinski himself used a feather a goose quill and uh, henry miller a famous neurologist uh, used his bentley key so if you don't have a bentley key it's okay you can use a, your house key or some other key and if you don't have a key available you can always use the back of the uh, knee hammer that uh, that you use for the rest of the cns examination now um, so that was the procedure. Coming to the Babinski sign, uh, there is a lot of doubt here. So everyone stresses on the fanning of toes and so uh, and, and they talk about the other toes, but the most important component or the most important uh, thing to say that there is a Babinski positive is to see the upward motion, the upward movement of the great toe. So dorsiflexion of the great toe is what defines a Babinski positive. It may or may not be accompanied by the fanning of toes. So fanning of toes is not a must. In fact, it was even 
added a bit later to uh, the Babinski's positive or the Babinski sign. The most important step is the upward movement of the great toe. And uh, fanning of toe m- m- may or may not be there and it is seldom significant. Uh, next, uh, something which the examiners love asking is what what is a true Babinski test or what are the components of a Babinski test? So the components of a Babinski test and a true Babinski test involve the same thing. So a, a, a true positive Babinski test or a complete positive Babinski test has five components. So it's not just your toe going up or toes fanning, a great toe going up or toes fanning, but it has five components. So this includes the extensor hallucis longus, the tibialis anterior, the extensor digitorum longus, the hamstring muscles, and even the tensor fascia lata. Yeah, so a true positive Babinski even has a slight abduction at the level of the hip. So it is only when these five muscles contract in response to your stimulus is when you say that the Babinski test is true or it's a true Babinski. So what are they? Extensor hallux is longus, tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, hamstring muscles, and the tensor fascia lata. And it's always good to repeat your test once more to be sure. So always, you know, when you do a test, do it twice just to be sure because sometimes you can get fallacies and you can just get odd uh, results once in a while. So one thing, uh, so this is something the examiners love asking, components of Babinski's test. So these are the five components. Uh, another thing that they, um, the oversmart ones tend to ask is regarding this Pusep sign and they won't ask you what the Pusep sign is. They just say things like, also, the person doesn't have a great toe or he's he had a great toe amputation and now he's come to you with some CNS symptoms and you want to know uh, if he's Babinski positive. So what do you do? So it's very easy. So when the great toe is absent and see, I've mentioned here, you look at the Pusep sign. So it's of Pusep sign is of great significance when there is an absence of the great toe. So what you do is you do the normal Babinski test, you do your normal procedure and you look for the abduction of the little toe, abduction of the little toe. So that is Pusep sign and that is of great significance when a person doesn't have his great toe. So since you all know that the Babinski t- sign is an indicator for a UMN uh, or a corticospinal tract disease, I didn't mention that earlier, but there can be physiological causes of uh, the Babinski positive. And if, uh, the most common physiological po- positive Babinski is seen in children. So normally it's abolished by 9 to 12 uh, months, but it can go up to 3 years uh, and it can take up to 3 years for a normal Babinski sign uh, or a normal Babinski positive to disappear. So children usually have a Babinski positive because their corticospinal tract is not completely uh, developed or rather it's not completely myelinated. So at around 3 years is when it gets completely myelinated and you start having a normal or a flexor response that we have. So Babinski positive is physiological in children and sometimes even in deep sleep they notice that it happens naturally and it is physiological. Uh, pathological Babinski, like I said, it is an indicator of the corticospinal tract function. So any lesion or any disease of uh, of the corticospinal tract will uh, result in a, um, a uh, positive Babinski sign. Uh, coming to uh, next uh, Viva favorite are the types of Babinski signs. So, so few of the ones which we're going to discuss include the minimal Babinski sign, the true Babinski sign, the pseudo Babinski sign. These three are very important, very frequently asked in Viva, and two more, which is the inversion of plantar reflex and the slow or tonic Babinski's sign. And those are less important, but the first three, minimal, true, and pseudo, are very frequently asked. So, what is a minimal Babinski sign? This is really simple. A minimal Babinski sign is a Babinski positive or a Babinski sign in which you have contraction of only the hamstrings and the tensor fascia lata. You don't see any difference below that. So, you have the hamstrings contracting and the tensor fascia lata contracting and nothing else. A true Babinski sign, I already told uh, about this earlier, when all five components which we discussed, the extensor hallucis, the extensors of the toes, the, the tibialis anterior, the tensor fascia lata, all of them, all those five, and the hamstrings, all those five elements contract together and the, you have a whole or a true Babinski response only when all five components act together. A pseudo Babinski sign, everyone loves asking this, okay, why why could this be a pseudo positive or what is pseudo Babinski positive? So this is nothing uh, but a, a Babinski-like sign or a Babinski positive uh, feature or the Babinski positive features seen in highly sensitive individuals or people with uh, hyperesthesia, plantar hyperesthesia, that is high increased sensitivity in the uh, plantar aspect of the foot. And even in cases with chorioathetosis where they there is rampant or uh, rapid and uh, unnecessary movements, so in all these patients, you can see a false uh, Babinski sign and 
here the fanning of toes is as or even more pronounced than the upward rise of the toe so that is one thing you can remember but the real uh, gold standard or the best way to differentiate a pseudo babinski sign from a true babinski sign is to check for the reproducibility so i i already mentioned this earlier that if you do it twice or thrice you know for sure that it is positive so reproducibility is not there if the patient gives a pseudo positive so the second time you do it he'll see he'll show you a flexor response or a third time you do it he'll show you a flexor response and also look for the contraction of hamstrings so this is very classical of a true babinski sign contraction of hamstrings is not that uh, common with the false or in the sensitive individuals uh, and rest of the cases um, now coming to the inversion of plantar reflex so this is nothing or this is a phenomena uh, that is seen when there is an injury to the flexor tendons of the foot or when there is a paralysis uh, to the muscles that uh, cause flexion of uh, the toes so when this uh, is absent your extensor response becomes more pronounced because there is no flexor action so there's only extensor action so when you stimulate you uh, tend to have an extensor response uh, so this is called inversion of plantar reflex lastly the slow and uh, tonic babinski sign this is when the toe great toe rises slowly uh, your first uh, toe rises slowly and uh, this is also called a majestic rise so this is seen in frontal lobe lesions and extra pyramidal lesions so slow babinski sign now this is the most uh, important part of this video this is uh, all the other stuff most of you would have known and you would have read already but this is something which is really important people tend to miss and it is a viva favorite i've even mentioned that here it is a everyone loves asking about this so these are babinski equivalents so what are babinski equivalents these are tests that can be done in place of babinski or they are tests that similar to that are similar to babinski which are done on the lower limb and give a uh, similar response so the result the your upward rise of the great toe and fanning of the toes is the same but the the test done and the stimulus we give is different so firstly uh, we'll go to the important one so you have to learn all of these all of the ones i've mentioned you have to learn and if there are even more you can check your books and online but these you have to know the names and the procedure there's a high probability that it is asked so firstly the chadok sign and the reverse chadok sign both of these are essentially the same thing so you stimulate over the lateral aspect of the foot i'll just show you a photo so the stimulus here on in babinski sign we give a stimulus on the plantar aspect of the foot like this so in chadok sign the stimulus is given on the lateral aspect of the foot so we begin just below the medial and malleolus and we actually go along the lateral aspect and how do we know we are in the right plane it's usually the zone where the plantar skin and the dorsal skin of the foot meet that's very easily identifiable so you go along that aspect start right uh, below the um, lateral malleolus and go up to the uh, base of the small toe and then you see a positive when when it is a positive individual you see a positive babinski sign so you start here and go like this and you get so that is chadok sign reverse chadok sign is nothing but you start from the small toe and you go towards the lateral malleolus and again you see the same response coming to the next sign uh, oppenheim sign this is also an again an exam favorite so here what we do is we basically give pressure either with a hand or with an instrument over the shin usually we we hold like this and go over the shin or the uh, anterior medial aspect of the tibia and we start just below the patella and keep moving down and as we move down we start seeing your babinski response in the foot uh, uh, the third thing third sign so we finish chadok river chadok and oppenheim the fourth sign is the gordon sign and this is really simple you just squeeze the calf muscles hard and you see a babinski positive um, so these are the four important uh, equivalents you have to know other than this i have also mentioned uh, the shafer sign this is very similar to your gordon sign but instead of pressing the calf muscles you squeeze at the achilles tendon right and lastly this is again uh, an exam favorite it's uh, it's called the hoffman sign so hoffman sign is actually not done in the lower limb at all so it is it isn't actually a babinski equivalent it's called the upper limb equivalent of the babinski sign so it is done on the upper limb not not on the lower limb so uh, this although it is called a babinski equivalent it is dif it's very different from babinski especially in the fact that this hoffman sign is a monosynaptic reflex whereas your uh, babinski is a polysynaptic reflex and uh, so how do you do the hoffman sign so this was asked to me in my viva and i got it wrong so i went back and studied about it and read about it so it's very easy i'll just show you a small picture so firstly uh, you basically rest the make sure all the muscles are loose and you rest the uh, man's hand you give support to your patient's hand just like uh, how you do in every other reflex and the fingers are partially flexed 
and then you hold the middle finger somewhat like this so you hold the middle finger of the uh, patient like this with the rest of the fingers flexed so you're holding it like this and you just you just flick flick at the nail bed you just give a small flick you can see how it's being done here you give a flick downwards and then you see this movement of the thumb and the uh, and the index finger so both these come together thumb the index finger flex flexes and the thumb abducts and they come together so i'll just show you so you're holding like this so you're giving pressure like this and you flick and whenever you flick these move like this so this motion this motion is what you see when you flick the middle finger this motion so uh, that's shown here too so that is a hoffman sign posture and it's indicative of a human lesion in the upper limb a few things i haven't covered here include the physiology of the pevinsky reflex so it's basically just a normal uh, reflex so if you know about the reflex arc uh, that's basically how this works um, and i'm pretty sure you'll be knowing that and you'll read that and it, it's important to remember that is a polysynaptic reflex it's a polysynaptic reflex and it involves uh, multiple synapses and basically it's carried by the sural nerve to the tibial nerve to the sciatic nerve and then to the highest uh, to the spinal cord and then comes back down through the sciatic tibial and sural and all along this course you have muscles contracting those were the five components so it's a polysynaptic reflex so those were the few vital points regarding the babinski reflex i uh, hope this was helpful bye i'm oh, sorry it took so long